From Diamond Pharmacy Services, this is Podcast Rx. On this episode, we welcome to the studio Sapphire Health Sales and Implementation Coordinator Nikki Tusky and Lead Architect Jeff Caruso. When Diamond Pharmacy decided to develop corrections focused EMR and EHR software over a decade ago, Nikki and Jeff were there at the ground level. Our conversation goes back to those early days to learn about the people and processes instrumental in building Sapphire into a reliable and trusted tool of correctional health professionals. We also discuss the impact that Sapphire can have on a facility's healthcare program and why an effective EHR is so much more than just the software. I'm Adam Campbell, and this is Podcast Rx. Nikki Tusky, Jeff Caruso, I want to welcome you both to Podcast Rx. How are you both doing today? I'm doing great. Good, good. Yeah. It's good, good to be here. Good. Well, I'm so glad you're both able to join us because in the brief history of Podcast Rx, we haven't done an episode focused on any of Diamond's subsidiary sister companies. And Sapphire is, pardon the pun here, somewhat of a hidden gem. So for those unfamiliar, since 2010, Sapphire Health has been building and implementing EMAR, that's Electronic Medical Administration Records, and EHR, Electronic Health Records Software, tailor-made for correctional health settings. And as of 2022, Sapphire has served over 400 correctional facilities in 36 states, with over 250,000 active patients in the program. Sapphire, of course, grew out of Diamond Pharmacy's decades-long experience in correctional health and the recognized need for a medication management tool that reflected the unique needs of jails and prisons. Nikki and Jeff, you've been with the company since the very beginning. Nikki on the sales and implementation side and Jeff on the development side. And because you've been here from the inception, I I really wanted to get your perspectives on the growth of the company and the product over time. So let's get into it. And, uh, you know, Sapphire's official founding was in 2010. But do either of you know how long before that Diamond Pharmacy was looking to get into developing EMAR and EHR? And what do either of you know about or remember about these earliest conversations within Diamond to develop a software like this? Um, well, actually, as you mentioned, in 2010 was the beginning of Sapphire. However, prior to that, we had worked with a previous EMAR vendor, and that kind of, I mean, it was working, it was working out. However, uh, we were running into some hurdles with, you know, requests from clients, um, and we weren't really able um, to get those requests done. So that's kind of where the thoughts are. Hey, wouldn't it be really cool if we did our own? Um, right. We would have control over these requests. If we had our own development team, we could do these things. And that's kind of where the, the conversations began. So we were partnered with another vendor prior to that. And then um, mm-hmm. that kind of all came out. Yeah, necessity being the mother of invention, basically. Yeah. So when I came online in 2010, I think it was June of 2010, the EMAR product at that point had existed for, I don't know if it was a a year or two, or um, there was an offshore team working on it. And I think the decision at that point had been made to bring the development completely in-house and try Mm -hmm. to phase out that offshore development team again, because the idea, like Nikki said, being we wanted as much control over the product as possible. Um, so that's when I came online and we really started rolling out the EMAR and improving it and, and updating it and, and getting it more, you know, ready for prime time, I guess. Right. Um, you both came to Sapphire, you just said 2010, both of you got here in 2010 now, 12 years. Um, what were your professional histories leading up to joining Sapphire? Um, well, uh, prior to that, uh, a decade before that, I actually started working for Dr. Dr. Uh, so I started at the very bottom. Um, I actually started here as a pre-packer and then moved into the, um, the correctional data entry. And then shortly after that, I started to run the correctional data entry department and I'm a supervisor. So I did that for, um, I would say, about 10 years. Um, and then when the EMAR, as I mentioned, that the previous vendor they were working with, um, they needed some help in getting those rolled out. So that's kind of when I came on board. Um, I think in 2009, I had worked with that. Mm. Yeah. What about you, Jeff? So my path's a little bit more twisting than that. Um, I got out of college in the fall of 2000, Mm. um, right before the dot-com bubble burst. And I had some friends that lived in D.C., so, you know, I made the leap thinking I was going to go to the city and, and, Mm. you know, do that startup thing. So I did work for a startup in D.C. for a while. Um, Then we all know what happened shortly after 2000, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when defense contractors really started 
hiring a yeah. lot of people. So mm -hmm. I actually got had some friends that worked for a company called Raytheon that's in State College, oh. PA. Yeah. So I got hired there, worked there for a few years, um, and then started wanting to move back to, you know, I grew up around here, this area, and I hadn't lived here for close to 10 years after mm -hmm. I got out of college. So we, I started, you know, we started wanting to be back in this area. So then I had a um, friend again that was working in a, a small defense contractor back in the John Murtha days when he had some money right. flowing to this area. So I got mm -hmm. online with them. And at the time, I actually had, I had tried to apply to Diamond um, and the, the development supervisor, Josh Hankinson had actually, you know, they had just hired someone uh, prior to that. So he basically said, you know, there were no openings, keep us in mind next time around um and that's what i did next you know when i had wanted to leave that that defense contracting job i basically reached out to josh again and that was in the you know the early part of 2010 we did the round of interviews and then i started working here in, in june of 2010 great now what nick you had been here a decade prior you know be been with diamond been firmly enmeshed in the culture and and, and Jeff, you just talked about your story, but what is, what specifically about Sapphire, what Sapphire was going to do, attracted you the most to want to be part of Sapphire in particular? Um, well, I, I was just kind of looking to be a little bit of a change. I love the company. However, um, I, I had some opportunities before that, and I was looking to be a contract pharmacist. So I was getting that face-to-face -face interaction with customers. Um, I like that aspect of it. And with the e more and going out to the actual collection of letters and doing the implementation, that was kind of something that I wanted to do. Yeah. And, and you, Jeff? I mean, honestly, I was just looking for dev work. And, okay. um, you know, that, mm -hmm. was, that was the job at the time. I had no previous medical or pharmacy or correctional experience at all. So a lot of right. it was brand new to me. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I came online, one of that initial things that, you know, Josh had, had spoken about and Mark had talked about was that was when the uh, the idea of an EHR kind of mm -hmm. was like fermenting in people's mind. We only had the EMAR product at that point. Mm -hmm. But one of the big things where they were trying to, you know, man up the team, bring some more people online because they kind of had the vision that at some point in the future, we wanted to expand that product into a, a more robust offering. So, you know, I was probably myself and another developer were some of the original hires with the idea of building up that internal dev team to to have the ability to make our own full EHR. Right. And that ties into my next question, which is of the available um, EMAR EHR programs that were there in 2010, what, what did that competition look like and what needs weren't being addressed that Sapphire was ready to meet or, or to develop toward? There were health records being used in the collection environment. However, they weren't built from the ground up with collection environment. So, as far as competition, I, I would say they didn't do that. I, I, I don't know. At least that we've seen, when Jeff and I were doing like field work to try to get an, an idea, because I'll be quite candid with you, I, I knew what an EHR was. Mm -hmm. I did not know or understand the complexity and all the components that went into making that health record. So, that sure. was really um, but as I said, when we were doing the full work of data requirements for the build, um, for him to build, um, we did do uh, a conference in New Orleans where we got to many health records, and everything that we used was, uh, was, was being used in the community setting. So um, we got to do a lot of work with that, but not things that were correct. Yeah, I think it, in those early days, I mean, there were correctional EHRs, but like mm -hmm. Nikki said, I don't know that they were specifically designed with correctional features. And honestly, a lot of them were what we like to call electronic file folders, where they uh -huh. weren't really like robust, functional electronic health records. They were more just a way to get rid of paper, right. let let nurses, doctors do their notes and upload them into an electronic format, but not really a functional EHR that had you know a lot of bells and whistles, more just a place that get rid of the big racks of paper, sure. basically, you know, store it electronically and, and that. But, I, you know, that was one of our original things was we really wanted to be correctional centric. And so that right. was, you know, like Nikki said, when we were doing that field work, a lot of it was, you know, let's go into these correctional settings and see what they're doing that isn't, be what needs they have that aren't being met by these off the shelf, mm -hmm. um, public retail facing EHRs that were out there. Sure. 
And with all that in mind, given that you came in without a, a health care background as a developer, just how tall of an order was this? You guys are talking about the field work to, to, to get that to the next level beyond just being a, uh, you know, basically a digital file cabinet. Um, was there any kind of precise template you were following? Was there any, you already said that there wasn't a lot of competition out there. So I'm going to assume that answer was no. It was just, we need to get out there, get the direct notes. How? So what was that process like and how many developers were part of this original build? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, honestly, the initial ask was literally, we need to build an EHR. Yeah, I don't think simple. there was a lot of institutional, we knew the pharmacy side and like Nick's team and, and mm -hmm. the, the transition specialists that were around at that time and some of the pharmacists that had worked on building up Sapphire, we had the pharmacy side of it down pat. We really knew yeah. um, physician order entry. Mm -hmm. We knew how to do med pass. But from an actual EHR standpoint, there was very little, if any, institutional knowledge. Nick and I did a lot of looking at other products. We went out to sites and looked at sites that were using you know off-the-shelf versions that they weren't happy with and did a lot of... You know, we did a lot of our own field work of just, hey, what does it do that you like? What does right. it not do that you need it to do? What does it do that you don't like? Um, so it was a huge, it was a tall order. Um, it was, you know, a lot of those initial couple first years were just building our own knowledge of like, mm -hmm. what does a correctional EHR need to look like? What features does it have to have? You know, what features are correctional centric? What do we need to focus on to, you know, meet those correctional needs? Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a, a tall order, no doubt. How many years of that would you say was field? I mean, I'm sure it's still going on in a way, but how that initial round, how how long was that period of field work and in knowledge building? 2000, late 2011. So mm -hmm. probably two full years of well wow. going out, looking at existing products, you know, Yeah. So there, I mean, there was a lot of early trips where, mm -hmm. you know, we went out and talked to existing clients, talked to clients that were using our EMAR and what, you know, mm -hmm. Hey, what features would you, would you need? Um, we also had a big, um, state client at that time that, you know, they were really good at coming to us and saying, Hey, we would like to have this feature. We would like to have that feature. Um, you know, we kept expanding that EMAR product with those feature requests but, you know, I think Nick and I would both say we owe a lot of what the EHR is today to our existing Diamond slash Sapphire customers because, yeah. I mean, they were our subject matter experts. We didn't yeah. have in-house EHR subject matter experts. We had to go out and talk to the doctors and nurses that were out there in mm -hmm. the field using our product and other products. And also the account reps at Diamond relationship with their customer, they were able to give us the guidance and put us in with the right people. But even though out there we install an EMAR, however, you know, I need a subset of individuals you know, in, in the bedroom and things like that. But um, Josh Ray Wilson, he's one of our account reps, uh, not Risco. Mm -hmm. Those guys that would do the PMP and, and had the connections within their contracts really were instrumental in hooking us up with people, the right people when we would get stuck. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Right. Was there, was there like a, within all, you say the whole customer base was, was instrumental, but was there like a specific uh, subset within that, that like most of the feedback came from, uh, like, was there one client that stood out the most that, that you were, that you were relying on to build those early versions? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I you know, I would say the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections was mm -hmm. one of our early EMAR yeah. adopters. Sure. Um, and they were huge. They had some good people that, like Nick said, with Gus, they had a really good relationship and he had a really good relationship with them and their medical director and their, you know, their project managers. And they were very open about, they liked the EMAR product and they were very open about, hey, you know, here's the features we need. Here's the features we would like to see. So they were very instrumental in, in some of that early development. Now we did have other customers that were out there, um, you know, Salt Lake County comes to mind as an early customer that was big on, on you know, the things they wanted. And, and I mm -hmm. look at them as one of our early EHR clients that really kind of taught us not only like what the RFP process is like and what, right. What, yeah. right. That was our first RFP win. We won first three RFPs. Yeah. And that was the first time that we won. 
I think having our own development team in house, I think that was one of the primary reasons they went with us and didn't pick someone within their own state. They actually went out on the line with us um, because they knew that we had the capability and the staff mm-hmm. to kind of communicate with the one. Yeah, and I think that's you know, that's been brought up time and time now in our discussion is how special Sapphire is as a company and as a product is how organic the whole thing has been. You know, that not a lot of companies can say that, that it's so, that everything was built completely from the ground up with, you know, fresh research and. Yeah, and for sure. That. I mean, I mean, I think, you know, I wouldn't say all of the features and stuff sure. that we have, but there is a large percentage of features that we have that were a direct result of a customer coming to us or coming to Nick's team and saying, Hey, we would really like to see the application do A, B, or C, and uh, and you know Nick's team turning that into dev requests, and the dev team taking those requests and turning them into actual you know application features at that point. Right, and I assume this relationship with the with these different entities is pretty casual, I, you know, and it those features that that would become hallmark were were developed pretty. Um, you know, pretty casually all told that, hey, we want to see this. Can you do it? It's it's not like this elaborate, drawn-out process. You just yeah. went for it. No. I mean, I, we would get requests via the, the pharmacy rep. Mm-hmm. Um, we would get requests, you know, just chatting on the phone. We'd get requests when we were out there doing training. Yeah, it was very casual. Uh, and then from that, if we had questions, uh, we would definitely take those to Jeff. If he had any additional questions on, typically when I get the request, when I get the tool, it's really great. And he hit me with, you know, 10 other questions that I didn't think about. So that's yeah. amazing. <laughs> we would uh, definitely uh, set up a meeting with, with the clients. And, you know, they had no problem giving us the requirements or kind of talking it out with us that we thought that they needed. I mean, I think we took really huge advantage of the early relationships that mm-hmm. our support our support team had Nick's mm-hmm. team had, you know, we have Kim Gardner on the support side that had a really good relationship with our EMAR clients. We right. also leaned heavily on the diamond relationships, you know, diamond had sure. an existing stable right. of customers that were out there that we were mm-hmm. EMAR that were using our EMAR product. And as Nick said, those, those consultant pharmacists had, you know, diamond had always had a really good relationship with their customers. And we had, you know, pharmacists like Gus and John Helms and those mm-hmm. guys able to point us to customers that were, you know, diamond customers, they might not have been Sapphire customers, but they were willing to like give us feedback. Yeah. Guys like that, that we leaned heavily on those existing relationships to, you know, go to those customers and, you know, and pick their brains basically and and get some ideas for what direction we needed to go and how to build the product into what it is today. Yeah. That was the thing. Everybody was always open and willing to help us from our diamond team to all of their customers. So we didn't have any sort of shortage of input from anyone. Yeah. With the, the, I want to just jump back to the EMAR for a second. Um, how how long was Sapphire primarily the EMAR prod, product until it became, you, AEHR became your dominant focus? Uh, about four or five years. Okay. Uh, more, more so five. I mean, we were working on the EHR in the background. Mm-hmm. A lot of my early days in the EHR was actually with Jeff and Nick and so, yeah, we, we were taking those ideas and suggestions and, you know, looking to see what we could do with that input. Yeah. So, but we actually the focus really, I think, was really front of the focus on the health record um, as far as putting it out there and getting it in production. Yeah, maybe late 2014. Now, I mean, the idea was there early on. Sure. Like I said, when I was hired, mm-hmm. you know, the idea was, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. idea was there that we wanted to build an EHR, but I also think at that time we were, like Nick said, we were kind of green and we didn't even really know how big of a process rolling out a functional EMAR mm-hmm. product to the correctional environment that was going to meet all of those EMAR needs, med pass, order entry, all mm-hmm. those things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, early on we did take a little bit of a step back and say, hey, let's make sure that we get a really good EMAR product yeah. first. Like, let's focus... Um, and I, I give Diamond and Sapphire a lot of credit for that because we could have blindly stumbled forward and tried to develop an EHR before we had a really good EMAR product. Sure. But, you know, the the powers that be and, you know, Mark and those guys were able to recognize, hey, the first thing we need to do is make sure we have a really good, a really stable EMAR product. So we did spend those initial, you know, 2010, 11, 12, 13, really stepping up our EMAR game and making sure we had a, a really stable product. Because again, it was also one of the 
original hosted EMOS solutions where we right. were hosting everything. Right. Um, so that was new to the correctional environment. A lot of the systems that were out there were not hosted solutions. They were on-premises solutions. So, you know, mm-hmm. we went to plenty of places where they didn't really even have internet access outside of a few areas of the jail or prison. So mm-hmm. there was a lot of those early days of, you know, hey, you're going to have to build out your uh, environment to make this product work. So I-, I will say, you know, we did spend those initial years building a really great EMAR product, and we were able to use that foundation to kind of springboard into what we now have is what I consider a really great EHR product. So, you know, build on a good foundation, I guess. Yeah, most definitely. And this is a, uh, this is a question of just pure curiosity here, uh, kind of apropos of nothing, but do you know who was responsible for the name Sapphire? Um, I'm not going to, I don't think it's a surprise that a company that's affiliated with Diamond would choose a gemstone based name, but I was just, I've, I've always wondered who, who thought up Sapphire. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. He was part, again, we mentioned there was a comp rep that he saw the client with this. Um, he, he was instrumental in, in helping us with Sapphire early on. And we would have these meetings, these team meetings, and we were sitting there and Mark was like, what are we going to name it? What are we going to name it? And, um, you know, we're all going back and forth. And in those days, Matt Pett and Jenner wore a lot of blue. And uh, we kind of huh. attributed that name <laughs> to that. But he was sitting there and if you know Matt Patton there, his, mm-hmm. his demeanor, what about Sapphire? And we're like, what? What about Sapphire? <laughs> we all just kind of sat there. And, and Sapphire, you know, that sounds great. Yeah. And I think it was just an off-the-cuff thing, and it worked. So we kept it. Yeah. But, yeah. That's where it came from, oh, very interesting. I I wouldn't have thought it was that. I I would have thought Mark Zildner. You know, that was a the Mark Zildner I mean, thing. We were all tasked with naming it. Sure. And we would come up with things. Uh, I think early on we were going for acronyms, you know, like mm-hmm. trying to think of cool little things. And Matt just went down the yard and like, "Oh, what about this?" And we just kind of came up with that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, use a lot of that data and that reporting to improve your processes over time. So, you know, that continual quality and improvement is, is a big part of the EHR and the electronic processes, you know, improving your processes through, you know, data reporting, manipulation, um, statistics, things like that. Yeah. And Nikki, I wanted to ask you about, Jeff spoke to a lot of it there, but you, you talked in a separate video project where we interviewed you and you talked specifically about audits, standards of care and the like. Can you speak to that as well? Um, yeah, a big thing in corrections is auditing and keeping in compliance with either ICPA standards or ACPA standards. So the first part of that is knowing those standards. Um, the second part is giving them an easy way to see if they're in or out of compliance with those standards. And that's that's where we kind of came in and we tried to develop features um, as a fingerprint. We tried to give them dashboards and things to monitor these things. So they can immediately see what's in and out of compliance. Um, one of the big things in keeping the standard, standards with NCPA, CNACA is intake. Um, when a patient is booked in, there's several things that have to happen to those patients. They have to have um, different assessments done. So one of the big things is we have um, what we call intake processing queue, which, which gives users visual indicators when things fall in or out of those compliance levels. As Jeff said, so that they can address that problem before it becomes a bigger problem. From an auditing perspective, it's easy for auditors to come in now and just at the click of a button, see if those standards, you know, if they fell in or out of those compliance standards. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of data at your fingertips. Um, back in the days, it used to be like they would come in and name a person and you have to pull their chart and they would dig through charts. Yeah. Um, now those audits go a lot quicker um, with all of the, the features that we have in our EHR. Yeah, there's a lot of time savings on the data side of things where, like Nikki was saying, when you, you had an auditor come in and ask you to produce proof of that you're meeting your mental health evaluation guidelines, you really had no choice but to go and pull paper charts and, you know, manually review them. Now you can simply go to our dashboard and, you know, say, hey, here's my last two weeks of intakes and here's when I did the mental health evaluations. You can see I'm within guidelines. You can run reports and, and prove that as well. So there are a lot of time savings there, um, you know. With the EMAR product, I know this is one thing we always tout that people used to hate with the old paper Mars. There's no end of month changeover, right? So mm -hmm. at the end of the month where you used to have to take a paper Mar and copy it across by hand, now you're doing that. It's happening automatically. So there's no end of month changeover manual process. So you're saving a lot of time on the nursing side uh, by doing that. Yeah, definitely. And with with uh, the features in mind, uh, I meant to ask you this earlier, Jeff, but was of, of all the suggested features that you got from your time in the field, and was which one was like the hardest to build, would you say? Uh, and yeah, you can, ch you can chime in on that too, yeah. of course. <laughs> from my perspective, from gathering a requirement perspective, um, the, the most difficult module, um, it definitely speaks to why, but from, from my part, was consultation. The consultation module, it is big mm -hmm. in directions. Um, maybe it was just part of it was truly really understanding it. I, I don't know, but to me that was a complicated. It was a complicated build or a complicated gathering of info. I guess I can't speak to the build part, but it was definitely mm -hmm. complicated on our end. Yeah, the consultations module, from a business logic standpoint is probably the most complicated piece we have because it has a lot of rules for routing information, mm -hmm. approvals, different approval tiers, um, different clinic types route to different things. And so from a business logic standpoint, Nikki is right. The consults module was extremely complicated and we worked hand in hand with, uh, you know, the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, as well as their current medical vendor to to get that piece to where it is. And, and we've since, you know, massaged it and modified it to work for other clients. But it was definitely from a business logic standpoint, a, a huge build out. Now, from sheer complexity and the feature, I think that really is one of the features that sets us apart is our dynamic form system. It, to the users, it doesn't look super complicated um, because it, it just kind of works. But if you could see how it works behind the scenes, it's probably one of the more complicated from a technical standpoint, not necessarily a business logic standpoint, mm -hmm. because what it actually allows you to do is customize the business logic to exactly how you want it to work. So you uh -huh. can kind of build the business logic into those forms. So from a customer standpoint, they're not really seeing how complicated that is, but from a from a development standpoint, the, the dynamic forms module that we have that lets us 
basically take a client's paper forms that they're used to using um, and mm-hmm. convert them into an electronic format. Uh, that's probably the most technical thing because we'd learned early on, and, and Nick can speak to this, I guess, is is trying to force your way of doing things on clients just doesn't work, right, Nick? Mm-hmm. Like it just didn't work out for us. Yeah. And, and another part to that, it wasn't just the building of the forms. We had to be able to attach actions to make forms and facilitate workflows. So that was another big complex piece of it. I guess I didn't look at that piece as being complex because you built that in the tool that we used to do all of this, mm-hmm. um, we really needed it in, in just in the work on a Monday and we had it. Um, I guess that's why I don't know how much of a weekend he needs to be in. It would be reduced in yeah. a very short time. I guess that, that's why I never looked at it as being complex. But, um, the early iterations were less complicated mm, you know that was sure. one of those p- features that grew and changed and and as nick said we want you know the the build out to allow our clients to apply their own business logic to those forms was mm. was complex and getting the forms to you know allow capture of data and mask things correctly and and do required questions and hidden sections and you know there are a lot of features in that dynamic form system um, that, you know, I think it's one of our best selling points because again, going out to these correctional facilities that have been on paper or possibly in a different electronic system who have been doing, you know, intakes, have been doing mental health assessments, physical assessments, chronic care clinics on paper, and they have a specific way they do them that, you know, every client is slightly different. They might, you know, obviously NCCHC says you have to do X amount of things for intake and physical assessments. Mm-hmm. But, it, you know, in our experience, each client is slightly different on how they do that. And, it and, yeah, it's, it's definitely, mm-hmm. it really and they didn't want us going out there and saying, here's how you have to do it. Right. We were able then with this system to take their intake, turn it into an electronic format and, you know, present to the end user. Hey, guess what? Yeah, you're switching to electronic, but it's the same intake you've been doing for 20 years. You're not right. going to see a bunch of new questions and a mm-hmm. bunch of new workflow. It's it's basically the same thing you have been doing. Instead of writing, you're now typing and clicking. Right. That customization is so crucial. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and it's a great selling point. I don't mean to call it selling point, but it gives great value because, as Jeff said, one of the key points is, we don't really have to teach them anything new. If anything, right. we're learning. Um, we're learning sure. their process. Um, but they, they don't have to learn anything new. It's the same form they've been using, just in a much form. Yeah, and then like Nick said, user buy-in is huge. Yeah. We we see that. We yeah. saw that early on with the EMAR. If you don't, you can have a great system, but if the users, the end users don't buy into using it correctly and using mm-hmm. it day to day, they will find ways around it. They'll keep an Excel spreadsheet somewhere instead of making right. appointments. They'll, you know, r- right. you know, they'll write down in, in Word documents notes and, and save them as, as files somewhere. So getting the user buy-in is, is huge to onboarding clients and getting them to actually use the system and, and use it effectively and, and efficiently. Uh, because if the, you know, if the end user doesn't buy into using it, it doesn't really matter how good the system is. It's not going to work out. Right. Well, and a big way of getting that buy-in, Nikki, you can really speak to this as the implementation coordinator is you're going out and you're doing so much hands-on training and uh, 24-hour availability for consultation and answering question, <clears throat> questions, excuse me. That's That's got to be huge for getting that buy-in because it's not like, here you go. All right. Good luck using it. And oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> We have our 24 hour reps that they would support staff and all of these people familiar with SOC libraries and how the contract and the software itself. But yeah, it's never, um, I think I've mentioned this in other things I've done to the Adam, but even my first clients that, that I've worked with, I still have conversations with if they need something to call me out. Um, and I welcome that. I, I don't know them. I, I welcome that. But yeah. Yeah, and I, th- I think that was a big part of the early success too. Is when we when we did decide when Nikki, you know, this was prior to me getting here, but I think mm-hmm. one of the things when when Nikki and her team and some of the original consultant pharmacists and Mark and those guys decided they wanted to have their own product, they really meant their own product in total. They did not want outside vendors doing support. They did not want right. outside vendors doing the training. 
So, you know, the, the full aspect, the full life cycle of Sapphire from, you know, RFP process to demonstrations to, uh, you know, contract negotiation, onboarding, training, you know, support, dev, those are all employees of Sapphire and Diamond. There is no outside vendor. So, you know, if you're calling us at, two, th- you know, I got woken up last night at 2.30 in the morning and oh, that was our support line. So, you know, yep. when you call our support line, you're getting somebody that works for Sapphire, that knows Sapphire, you can get through to that support and that's 24-7, 365, you know, in the, and that's a big part of our success as well is, you know, like Nick said, that those early clients we worked with, that was a struggle we had is getting mm-hmm. support, getting help with the product. Right. We, I think that, honestly, that really opened our eyes to, yeah, you, again, you can have a great product, but there are other aspects. The product is the full thing, right? The product is not just the technical side of things. It, mm-hmm. The product is what the customer sees and the customer sees the training, the support, the phone support, the, you know, the after rollout support, the go live support, you know, after hours uh, being able to call our help desk to, to the end user, that is the whole product. It's not just the, you know, the buttons they're clicking and the keyboard they're typing. It is the full life cycle of that product. And I think we've really done a good job of, of focusing on all aspects of that. So we're able to bring a good product to bear across the board. You're not, we're not deficient in any area. We have a great technical product but we also from you know nick's side have a great rollout process from you know kim gardner's team we have a great phone support you know they have great relationships with our customers so we're able to have you know that whole process laid out and and working really well yeah and with the feet going back to the features specifically for a moment um you may agree on this may disagree but what what features would you say or feature is the most impactful for a correction client if you had to pick one of the kinds you were mentioning, you know, intake processing you talked about, you talked about the custom forms, maybe it's one of those, maybe it's another one, but what, what would you pick and say that that this is going to have the most impact on a facility? Everything. Um, I can't pick just one. I got to be honest. I can't, I can't pick just one. Okay. Uh, We have correctional specific features. Again, that, that's a selling point for us. Um, We give you a quick, easy, efficient way to manage TV. Um, we give you a quick, easy, efficient way to manage all of your immunization, um, your intake. Your, I, yeah, it's probably tough to say. I mean, honestly, it, going back to the early product, I, again, one of the things we really focused on was having a really good medication pass. Mm-hmm. A lot of, yeah, a lot. A lot of the EHRs that are out there currently, they still don't have medication passes, especially Mm -hmm. an offline medication pass. And that was another thing we learned early on with with our adventure with the other vendor was having something that required internet connection all the time just wasn't feasible. In these correctional settings, they're not exactly on the cutting edge of technology, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. whether it's budgetary concerns or constraints or whatever or, or physical limitations of these older prisons and jails, they weren't exactly on the cutting edge of, you know, having high speed gigabit Ethernet and things like that. So having that offline med pass where they can download the med pass, go out into the units, pass medications, mm-hmm. that was huge. And and we did perfect that early on. I think we were at the time one of one of, if not the only um EMAR that had a fully working offline medication pass where they could mm-hmm. download their pass, disconnect, go out into the units, pass their medications fully electronically with barcode support, you know, scanning medication cards. I mean, we, yeah. Yeah. And that that and, and still to this day, that's one of our, our selling features selling, is it is one of our biggest selling points um, yeah. directed that really is I mean we've had Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeff, given given your story of arriving at Sapphire, uh, you know, you didn't have the health background, but you jumped right into it with both feet, and you've been now uh, twelve years with the company. What? How do you? Um, how do you think Sapphire has grown the most since the inception over a decade ago? What? What would you? And how would you say Sapphire has pioneered correctional EHR from your perspective and being right in it? Ooh, that's a that's a, a broad question. Um, I mean, in recent years, one of our biggest you know growth areas have has obviously been what I would call interoperability, um, being able to 
connect to a lot of these outside systems. Um, mm -hmm. In the early days, you know, if you had lab results, you still got them over a fax machine and you had to scan them and upload them into your into your EMAR. Um, we've kind of in the last few years really focused on interoperability. And that means all aspects of the health record are electronic. You can do electronic requisitions for your labs. You can do mm -hmm. electronic requisitions for your image studies. You get those results back electronically. We have done connections to jail kiosk systems. We have done connections to state hospital, hospital systems. Mm -hmm. State immunization registries was a huge one that, that we... I don't know that we pioneered it, but in the COVID, when COVID really took off, there was a ton of extra work that the sites were having to do of updating their state immunization registries with all of the immunizations mm -hmm. they were doing. So for a lot of our clients, we took on the task of doing that electronically and saved them a ton of extra work where when they put their immunization in Sapphire, it went out automatically to these outside systems. So I do think that that interoperability has gotten has been a buzzword in the last mm -hmm. few years of of correctional EHR and and us expanding our capabilities in that area has been a has been a big you know focus point in the last sure. few years. Well, Nikki, I want to ask you um, a similar cumulative question, and you since you've been here the same amount of time, what what's some of the more memorable feedback that you've gotten from clients about how Sapphire has improved their processes and made life better for them? Well, one of the ways it has made life better for them is eliminating that more reconciliation process. That saves them a lot of time, but not only time. Um, they were paying a lot of overtime to have people do this much more reconciliation. So eliminating that was huge. Um, one of the more memorable stories that, that I remember was, was at a show from one of our early clients. And one of their big things was they needed an EHR because they were getting an audit at the end of, at the end of January. And so they wanted this quick. And we were able to turn it around and got it implemented pretty quick. And one of the standout stories from that is that during the audit, um, they were missing a question on a form. And they were able to call us as we thought of it, we were standing there, call us and have that question added. And that mm -hmm. was pretty remarkable, not only to the, the client, but to the auditor as well. Um, not only did the client pretty much for that, but the actual person that did the audit, I ran into at an NCCAC show, and he came up and said she's never taken it. So that, that story always stood out to me because mm -hmm. I didn't realize like how beneficial that was to you know have people like Yeah, that's that's excellent. I, this I've learned so much. I've worked with you on other projects, you know, to tell the company story, but to hear you both lay it out like this has been really great in this in this hour that we've had. I do want to end things though by uh, touching on how easy it is to get started with Sapphire. Um, you know, if if we've got a correctional facility listening out there now and they're really intrigued, what's their first step in becoming a Sapphire user? Uh, the very first step would be to look up our new website, www. Great new website out there. It highlights all the features, all the functionality we offer. Make a simple click to contact us for them. So that's yeah, and I, I would say the same thing. Go to our website, contact us. We are more than happy to do, you know, web demos or an or even an on-site demo. You know, that's one of the things that, that again that we've really been good at is you know making sure that our our customers and our potential customers really see our commitment from the very beginning. So you know, reach out to us and we'll we'll get you a demo, and and I think you'll love the product. Well, Nikki and Jeff, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come on here and talk more about Sapphire. This has been great, and I hope you'll come on again. Yeah, thanks for having us. Adam. Yeah, of absolutely. Course. Have us back for sure. Definitely will. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely will. But in the meantime, do check out www. I'm sorry, www.sapphire-health.com to learn more about Sapphire. All right, thanks again, guys. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. 
This podcast features conversations with healthcare professionals. Their statements and opinions discussed herein are for informational purposes only. This podcast should not be considered professional medical advice and should not be used as a substitute for the advice of an appropriately qualified and licensed healthcare professional. Therefore, listeners must not rely on the statements made herein. Podcast RX is a production of Diamond Pharmacy Services, the nation's largest correctional pharmacy provider. Catch our new episodes on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Please rate the show and leave us a review. And if you have a topic you'd like to hear about on the show or you'd like to share your thoughts on an episode, you can email us at podcastrx at diamondpharmacy.com.